Hi everyone, welcome to Lecture 4, Strategy Development and High-Level Decision Making. Henry Mintzberg, who's a famous uh, scholar, consultant in this area, has uh, this to say about planning. Planners shouldn't create strategies, but they can supply data, help managers think strategically and program the vision the rise and fall of strategic planning. And what Henry Mintzberg is really saying is that information and choices strategy is probably the most important part of this process. So here's where we are in the overall course so far. We have done a little bit of work on strategic analysis. Now we're going to look at how we develop the strategy. And the strategy, as you can see, is based on these outcomes, positioning, how we want the firm to be positioned for uh, customers against competitors, our marketing objectives, we may be competing in different markets, product markets we call these. Um, generally these are run by different business units. There's segmentation and, and strategy that follows from that and the value mix strategy that follows as part of that. So the emphasis on, on this chapter, this lecture, is the development of marketing related strategies within the context of the corporate and business unit strategy planning decision making. Specifically, what are the inputs? What are some of the things we need to develop uh, an actionable strategy. The process of strategic thinking, uh, problem solving and decision making that flows from that, and the, do the development of what we call a high level marketing strategy for the firm, be it a small business, be it a not for profit, or be it a large corporate like Virgin. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Okay, so let's start with product marketing strategies. So one of the one of the uh, classic strategies is what's called the ANSOFT product marketing mix, product market matrix or growth matrix. And really, the decision here is uh, we have existing products and new products, and we or services, and we have existing markets and new markets. So we may want to get more of the same market, all right, or with our existing market, we might launch, we might develop an incremental innovation, or we might choose to go overseas or interstate or to another area or another marketing channel, develop new markets. Finally, we've got radical innovation down here, which is really new, new to the world markets. The less riskiest one is clearly up here, followed by this, but the ones that have the greatest reward are over here as well. Related to this is, uh, um, which was published in Harvard Business Review in May 2012 by Najif and Tuff, is the idea of the innovation ambition matrix. And basically this is where how much the organisation may wish to change in the product services uh, it develops. So we could look at our core, we could expand into different markets, or it could be completely transformational up here developing new products and assets, incremental products. This is very similar, as you would have guessed, to the ANSOF matrix, which we've looked at earlier, entering adjacent markets and customers or creating new target market needs up here. So you might say the, the iPhone smartphone might fit here, moving to adjacent markets, that might have been from the iPhone to the iPad. The core, uh, looking at existing customers, might be the mobile phone market today. Of course, another way of, of thinking about where we might want to position the firm globally, and by globally I mean in the marketplace, is where we might sit on the product life cycle and whether we can extend that life cycle or not. While the product life cycle has come in for um, some criticism lately in that it's, you know for sure exactly where you are, it is important to recognise that sales do not go for it, go on forever. Eventually, they will decline as substitutes or new new products uh, into the market. Secondly, you can think of this as a market evolution strategy as well. That this represents the change in the market evolution, and there are nevertheless important guidelines of growth strategies, competitive strategies, sort of a mature strategy, and then the decision to extend a life cycle or not. Uh, which are important in strategic thinking. Now related to that is many firms may work, operate in more than one market. And so the decision needs to be made over which markets we would compete in and how we will um, allocate our resources. Another way of thinking about this is the BCG, which stands for the Boston Consultancy Group Product Portfolio Model. And it's, and it's based on two things, high and low growth, 
What's low? Low is anything below 10%. Relative market share. Relative market share is your share, your sales divided by that of the largest competitor. And it's believed if you have sales significantly larger than the largest competitor, you have advantages in distribution costs, manufacturing costs, and so on. So anything with a relative share less than one is low over here. Here's an example for you to do, and obviously we won't, I won't ask you to do it, but here's an example um, of, a, of how a company might use this approach. So the beauty of the BCG model is that we will often know our sales, we'll often know the sales of the largest competitor, and we'll know the growth rate. So we can work out where we might sit in, in, in this matrix quite easily. Okay, so the dollar sales here, so the, the top, the, the largest competitor in the, in the commercials is 1.6, right? So the top three, so that's a relative share of one. In the next one, it's about 1.5, because we're at the top, and that's 1.2. In luxury cars, you can see it's we're four because that's the largest, and so on. Okay, when you position some of these uh, um, things in a grid, which you can do quite easily, you come up with some various types of strategies. For the commercial market here, the idea is to build uh, market share, to have a growth strategy, build new channels of distribution, uh, build awareness, and so on. The harvest strategy is about harvesting for margin. You would drop unprofitable distribution channels. Uh, you, you monitor the effectiveness of advertising and marketing expenditure. So really, a harvest strategy is trying to maximise cash flow to build to invest into stars. The, the build or divest for a question mark is really, do we go into this market or not? And in the last one, the milk or divest. Milk means selling off business units and plant and equipment and eventually exiting that market. Now related to this uh, approach is what we call the, the General Electric McKinsey Market Attractors. So McKinsey are a, a consultancy company. General Electric, of course, are a large um, electrical uh, provider, electrical services and appliance provider. And they also work in areas diverse as the defence sector, space, as well as the household electricals you might be familiar with. Here we put in things like uh, relative market share, which are these little things, and we have a whole range of market attractors and business po position which are scored by managers. So the idea here is to get managers to think about which areas that they want to be in. And you can see here, the, the matrix talks about high overall level, medium, and these are areas down here which we probably would not want to compete in or perhaps should consider our position. So I guess both the the GE model and uh, McKinsey model and the BCG are really about where we're going to focus our efforts on. So have a think about this. Uh, what are some of the, the strategies, uh, what are some of the SPUs that are structured in the Virgin Corporation, the common goal of the Virgin brand? And if you go to this website here, you can see that there's quite a bit of information about the various brands. So here's some of the uh, product markets. When we're talking about product markets here, here are some of the markets, and here are some of the products and services. And Virgin is quite a unique. I think as some, um, it's reported there are something like 200 different companies which operate across a range of markets. And of course, in this kind of business, uh, a decision needs to be made over which areas they're going to expand in, which areas they're going to harvest from, which areas they might not want to be in. Okay, so related to this is the concept of competitive advantage, and we can look at it in two ways. The first one is doing something better than the than all our competition, and there are, so we may take a cost leadership position here. So McDonald's has a cost leadership in fast foods, or we might follow a differentiation strategy. Apple in smartphones and in laptops does not have the highest market share, share nor does it aim to compete on costs, but it differentiates, differentiates, differentiates itself on design and um, features, as well as branding. Or we may want to focus on a market niche in terms of cost leadership. So we might, for example, be the Lexus car, which is a value for money luxury car, or we may want to differentiate ourselves 
as a premium uh, economy brand in the in uh, in airlines such as uh, Virgin. We can think about these strategies based on now we're looking within a market over where we might want to compete. So, for example, if we have a high degree of, of differentiation and our costs are high compared to the competition, we're better off being in the market niche, for example, Rolls Royce and Ferrari. If we have high degree, but our costs are low, then we may follow a differentiation strategy, which may yield margins. Okay, An example of that might be um, firms like Samsung, or it might be um, Sony. Uh, if we have a low degree of variation and high, we're in a lot of, a lot of trouble. And if we have a low degree of, vari of differentiation and our relative costs are low, we should really consider a cost leadership strategy. This is really rel this uh, next model, um, which talks about looking inside the organisation and finding sources of competitive advantage here. And this is really based on what we call the resources and positioning. So we look at skills, resources, capabilities. We look how that can generate value and low relative costs. We link it to performance out outcomes and then we develop the strategy. So here the strategy is not being set as you, as you might think as a set of commandments that we follow, but rather by looking inside the organisation of its strengths and appropriate resources. What are superior resources? Brand name, access to um, markets, distribution channels, um, a whole range of competitive advantages. Capabilities can also be in there. So it could be things like uh, how well our customer service is, uh, how well we uh, fulfill orders in terms of uh, online retailing. Okay, so that, so really this is an approach very much built these days on, I suppose, the, the, the access to big data analysis, both internally and externally into the firm. So really strategy here evolves rather than as preset. Now we're going to have a look at a couple of examples of strategy, and I'm going to ask you to think about um, two different approaches here. So one is Adidas and the other or Adidas, and the other is um, Nike, and you can see they're following quite different strategies. And the question I'm going to ask you to think about is why and which one you think is the most effective. Okay, let's have a look at the approach here followed by Nike and see how it varies.
Oops. Okay, so based on the two ads, what do you think Adidas competitive position and how does it differentiate itself against Nike? What should Nike's strategic position be? Well, in both of those ads, if you look at them carefully, you'll see the different mark product markets that are being appealed to, perhaps one or two in the Adidas, Adidas campaign, and in the Nike campaign, very much focused on the athletic achievement. And you might ask you, well, what should Nike's strategy? Should they, should they follow Adidas into these markets, or should they differentiate themselves and be more of a sports person's brand? That's something for you to think about in this area. Now, the last part of this approach is something that we call DuPont's, uh, sorry, uh, ratio analysis. And ratio analysis is taking, uh, particularly if firms have publicly available information, although private companies should also consider this as well, then we can compare how well the firm is performing financially. The text talks about a number of approaches that you might want to consider here. Um, these ratios are useful because they can be benchmarked to industry and good practice. And so you can really start to see how effective the marketing strategy is, current and proposed, in delivering um, financial benefits to the firm. I'm on a board for not-for-profit and I can tell you that some of these um, uh, areas like asset turnover, uh, net profit to sales, operating expenses ratio are particularly important. All these really are a series of ratios. These can be easily put in a spreadsheet and often uh, these may be these are published with publicly available information. So if you wanted to look at Nike versus Adidas, we could compare these ratios to see how effective each of these companies are with their marketing strategy. Here is a really uh, straightforward, I think, a nice video which starts to, in three minutes, explain some of the key aspects. There, of course, are a, a greater discussion in your text. Financial ratio analysis explained in three minutes. Sometimes it's not enough to simply say a company is in good or bad health. To make it easier to compare a company's health with other companies, we have to put numbers on this health so that we can compare these numbers with the numbers of other companies. So now, how do we use numbers to assess company health? This is where financial ratios come in. The very common types of financial ratios are liquidity ratios, profitability ratios, and leverage ratios. Liquidity ratios can tell us how easily a company can pay its debts so that the company doesn't get eaten up by banks or other creditors. An example of this is the current ratio. This tells us how much of your company's stuff can be easily changed into cash within the next 12 months so that it can pay debts which need to be paid also within 12 months. The higher your current ratio is, the less risky a situation your company is in. Now moving on, profitability ratios can tell us how good a company is at making money. An example of this is the profit margin ratio. This tells us how much profit your company earns compared to your company's sales. Normally. A higher number is better because you want to earn more profit for every one dollar of sales that you get. And finally, what about leverage ratios? These can tell us how much debt the company is using to make the company run and stay alive. An example of this is the simple debt ratio. This tells us how much percentage of a company's assets are paid for by debt. Normally, a company is considered safer when the debt ratio is low. Note that this was just a very simple overview. There are a lot more financial ratios and many different ways of using them, plus a lot of problems and disadvantages in using them as well. Would you like to super easily learn more about many financial ratios 
with even deeper analysis and detail, check out my free videos at nbabullshit.com. See you there. Again, I must admit, I do like the name of that uh, video. Okay, so um, you can see here the profit ratio is a nice one to look at. You should look at that, these in your assignment when you're doing the uh, information if they're publicly available. Um, it, these are really important uh, metrics that you can look at. And, and again, when you go into the workforce, having knowledge about these metrics is something that will land you a nice job. So I'd like to see that happen as well. Now, that's it for now. Um, of course, there are always more that, are, uh, that has been written about this in the textbook and online topics for information. Thanks for your attention, and I hope to talk to you soon.